Hello, everyone, and welcome to the next in the series of statewide synchronous sessions for Sociology 111. This week, we're going to be covering two chapters, Chapter 17, Government and Politics, and Chapter 18, The Economy and Work. So, let's get started with Chapter 17. We're going to be looking at power and authority, what they are and how they differ. We'll be examining different types of government, um, taking a look at political behavior in the U.S., a um, couple of what are called models of power structure in the U.S. C. Wright Mills gives us an example of one of those. Um, looking at war and peace definitions and what they mean. Political activism on the Internet. Um, and we probably will take a look at campaign financing, but I'm not sure if we're going to have time to do that or not. Some of the questions we'll be trying to answer, um, looking at young people, are they more interested in their portable me media players than in political issues? How does government maintain its power? How do political parties and public interest groups attempt to exert theirs? These are some of the questions we're going to be look at, looking at. In addition to, um, does our campaign finance system put some groups at a disadvantage? So, politics is a social institution that creates, implements, well, not necessarily creates, but creates through legislation, creates and implements um, social policy, system of political, or a polit political system um, essentially acts as the mind of a nation. It's the one that distributes power, sets goals, regulates peace, maintains public order rather, um, goes to war, makes the decision to go to war or not to go to war. Political system is of course comprised of people but it is a social institution. Essentially it is the social institution that is also responsible for um, taxes in the for wealth reallocation in the form of taxes, but it essentially is what makes decisions for a society. One definition of politics is who gets what, when, and how. Power. Power is the ability to get done what you want to get done despite objections raised by anyone else. Weber defined it as the ability to exercise one's will over others. Weber recognizes that there were three sources of power in a political system. Force, influence, and authority. Uh, force is the clenched fist, threatening, the do it or else kind of thing. Influence is using the power of oration, the power of persuasion to convince people to follow your lead. And then authority is institutionalized power that's kind of what you might think of as legitimate power recognized by the people over whom it is exercised. Why do we pull over for a police officer? Why do we pull over for a fire truck? Because we recognize that they have the power to do that. They have the authority to do that. Looking more specifically at authority, Weber came up with the idea that there are three types of authority as well. Traditional authority, which is authority based upon a historical tradition um, within a particular society, legitimate power conferred by custom and accepted practice. For example, passing the throne of a particular country on to one's heirs, one's children. So monarchy would be a form of official, uh, traditional authority. Charismatic authority is authority that rests in kind of an individual, in one person. 
Um, power made legitimate by leaders' exceptional personal or emotional appeal to his or her followers. Um, think about some of the leaders, and most of them wind up being despots, but if we think about like Hitler um, and Stalin, this would have been charismatic authority, authority centered within an individual because an individual managed to convince um, a nation to follow. And finally, we have rational legal authority. That's the authority we find in the U.S. It's power made legitimate by law, but it also is, in a certain sense, power of office rather than power centered in a family or in an individual. In England, they do have traditional authority, but most of the political power in England now rests in the House of Commons, and that's where you find the rational legal authority, uh, the authority of office rather than of individual. Regardless of who holds the office, the power is constrained in similar fashion. Um, in the U.S., if you think about the office of the most powerful, they say the most powerful man in the world, the president, but if the president doesn't have the cooperation of Congress and or the courts, nothing gets done. So I mentioned a couple types of government, or at least one type of government, monarchy, um, from uh, mono meaning one, monarchy, one ruler. Uh, it's a form of government wherein there is one person who has the throne of that country through legitimate succession. The next would be an oligarchy, which would be a collection of individuals. There are a few individuals that have power and wield power and actually make decisions. Then we've got a dictatorship. Now this is where one person has all power. Um, within a particular society, uh, like Fidel Castro um, and his control over all aspects of Cuba, Cuban policy and Cuban law. And then totalitarianism, which involves complete government control and surveillance um, over all aspects of a society, social and political law. Um, the former USSR was a totalitarian regime. Got democracy, which is governance by the people where everybody is guaranteed to participate. We don't have what would be called a true democracy. We have a representative democracy. We essentially vote for people um, to go and do all of the important functions of government for us. We elect them for periods of time. If we were a true democracy, every single issue that comes up in the Senate, in the House, every single law um, that's getting ready to be signed would have to be put to a referendum vote. So what we really do is we kind of elect people to go and make a lot of those decisions for us with the idea being that if we don't like the way they made those decisions, we can elect somebody else at a future time. A couple of recent decisions by the Supreme Court, specifically Citizens United and McCutcheon, decisions where campaign contributions have been ruled a form of free speech and therefore protected by the First Amendment and not subject to any kind of limit have led to questions about exactly how representative our government is anymore of anything but the interests of the elites in this country. When we look at political participation in the last election, um, I've heard in numbers ranging between 36 and 37 percent of eligible voters turned out. When we talk about political organizations, we're talking about an even smaller amount of people. That's just people that turn out to vote. But in the U.S., only a small minority of citizens really participates in political organizations on a local or national level. 
2008 where it says 62% that was actually a spike um, in eligible voters actually turning out. That was the year that Barack uh, Obama ran for the first term um, and really galvanized a lot of people that got out and voted. Um, as I said, the most recent election, the one that was just held earlier this month, the estimates are that 30, between 36 and 37 percent of eligible voters turned out to vote. As I said, in theory, the government is accountable to the voters. The idea of political participation makes it matter to the politicians because they have to continue to get elected. Unfortunately, as there's now a question over how well um, or how much influence having money has, even in the more regional politics simply because people can be reached with 30 second sound bites just about anywhere now. Additionally in the US when we look at uh, representation in the House and Senate which is 535 people more than I believe it's 80 percent of the members of the House and the Senate are white males. So political strength, political participation in the form of running for and holding office is overrepresented in our society by white males holding office and underrepresented for other groups, minority groups. There has been some progress, but it tends to be very slow progress. Sarah Palin was partially correct when she said that she had been unfairly targeted by the media. It wasn't specific to her, um, but female politicians are subject to a different level of scrutiny and a different type of reporting than male politicians. Um, female politicians tend to get elected in for a minority group the largest numbers, uh, especially at um, local and municipal level politics. But the media do cover them differently. C. Wright Mills is the one that gave us this idea of a power elite model. Um, society is ruled by a small group of individuals. Um, what Mills originally wrote was there's a small group of military leaders, political leaders, and economic leaders who shape the nature of uh, and the direction of our society. So that was the C. Wright Mills model. Um, power rests in the hands of a few. It's just, it's easier to see what you have in common with other members of the elite class with whom you interact than it is to see what you have in common and what might be needed amongst poorer people. We've also got Dumhoff's model, which takes a look at, again, kind of this um, coming out of a conflict perspective of power elite and elites. Um, looks at roles played by elites of corporate community and leaders of policy for formation organizations. So Dumhoff was taking a look more specifically at um, a group like ALEC the American Legislative Exchange Council, which comes together with, where economic leaders come together with political um, advocates to write laws that are then passed on to members of uh, 
Senate and Houses, State Senate, State Houses, and even at the federal level. So the two coalitions, corporate conservative and liberal labor. This is the only functionalist approach. The others are all kind of a conflict approach. We've got the pluralist model, um, which basically says that there are enough competing interests within any one society, um, enough groups competing to have uh, political influence that no single group then becomes dominant. And it is, in fact, the very variety of the groups that enable the government to function because these groups play significant roles in decision-making. The pluralist model can't really account for how elites continue to have their interests more recognized and served by the government um, than the common people. So, war, specifically defined as conflict between organizations that possess trained combat forces equipped with deadly weapons, is something that frequently happens in the world. The legal definition really requires the actual declaration of war by whichever body does that in a particular society. In the U.S., of course, it's Congress that has the power to declare war, not the president. There are, at any given time, somewhere in the world, troops engaged in combat. Um, for the entirety of the 20th century, the U.S. had forces deployed somewhere in the world engaged in combat. Might not have always been formal declarations of war, but there was combat going on. Global View uh, studies how and why nations become engaged in military conflict. Uh, what causes the conflict between nations? The nation-state view stresses interaction of internal political, socioeconomic, and cultural forces and looks at how the internal activity of a nation affects its decisions. And then the micro view, of course, looks at the social impact of war on individuals and their groups, what happens. Um, a lot of people become part of another group by serving in combat. What happens? What changes do these people undergo? So peace, the opposite of war, can be defined simply as the absence of war, um, but a broader definition would say that it's a more of a proactive approach to trying to develop cooperative relationships and where there is competition and conflict, try to resolve it in a fashion that doesn't cost lives. Uh, the UN itself was supposed to be the largest peacekeeping force on the planet because it was supposed to give nations a forum in which to resolve differences without resorting to combat. So we're not doing too hot on this list, as you can see. We're not at the bottom, but we're not certainly not at the top. Um, as more and more countries are able to participate in the global economy and reap the benefits, um, they have more reason to support um, economic development over war. And so trade may actually begin deterring wars. And uh, non-governmental organizations 
would be troops that are funded and employed by privately held corporations and other private firms. Of course, the paradox of uh, war and peace is that as soon as you resort to war, you've, in certain sense, according to some philosophers, already lost the battle. Nations um, cannot maintain security through threatening violence. Terrorism is really a couple of defining characteristics of terrorist attacks are one, they're on very symbolic targets. Two, they make no distinction between military and civilian targets. So terrorism is war in a different way because any citizen of a society um, is equally probable as far as being chosen as a target. But if we think about what the buildings were that were targeted in 9-11, we see three very symbolic buildings there. The World Trade Towers, kind of the economic heart of the U.S., the Pentagon, the military, and then, according to some reports, the third was headed towards the executive, uh, the White House, which would be um, then uh, political. So we had the political, military, and industry, um, or economy, targeted. And the idea behind terrorism is that, of course, the end justifies the means, and so whatever accomplishes the goal um, is justified from a Machiavellian perspective. Um, we've seen this demonstrated by ISIS or ISIL, whatever you want to call them, um, when they did the beheadings on videotape and then sent it in and they were shown on TV. So um, media is a kind of important aspect of contemporary terrorism and that allows the terrorists to get their message out. From uh, a little bit more critical perspective, a perspective perhaps Jane Addams might have taken, um, terrorism and terrorist movements kind of become symbolic enactments of masculinity. That should be news, not new. Um, but people are increasingly turning to the Internet um, politically beyond getting the election news, the election results online. Um, it's easy to reach out to people in an online format. There are a number of organizations devoted to political um, information, enlightenment, recruitment, participation uh, efforts just all over the internet and it's not necessarily just about traditional party politics or even domestic politics um, in some countries it's illegal to have private access to the internet but that doesn't stop people from doing it and as we witnessed during the Arab Spring the internet provided um, a place for communication to occur um, in many of the nations. 
and the way that we saw the Arab Spring kind of spread across a lot of different regions, it, it shows kind of the idea that uh, borders, you know, as far as keeping nations separate, um, are not something that the Internet can effectively regulate or that countries can effectively regulate in the presence of the Internet. So, what should we do about campaign financing? We spent $5.2 billion for the 2008 election. And as you can see, a majority of people actually object to the Citizens United decision. They do believe that there should be limits on campaign spending, but not necessarily limits on what a candidate should be, should be able to spend. The problem then, of course, becomes that politics becomes a game for wealthy people, and only wealthy people can afford to participate. The Federal Campaign Act of 1974 attempted to place some kind of spending limits um, in that the, you can only donate a certain amount for national office. However, there are loopholes that allow soft money contributions, and now, more recently, we have Citizens United and McCutcheon United, which say that you can't donate unlimited to specific campaigns. Uh, but you can donate unlimited amounts of money to be used in political advertising. So when we look at this, um, think about the idea of campaign finance from our theoretical perspectives. From a functionalist perspective, um, political contributions keep the public involved in the democratic process. If you, even if you just donate as a private citizen what you can, less than $100, um, you're still invested in the campaigns of the individuals to whom you donated. Conflict theorists look at campaign finance um, as a doorway for political influence. People can spend money on politicians in order to kind of exert their ways and protect their own interests. And then interaction is focused again at that micro level, looking at the negative idea people have about politics and how money drives U.S. elections, and so in a certain sense it creates a self-fulfilling prophecy because people don't participate and then whoever has the most money wins. If people participated, that might not be the case. There are people advocating for the overturn of Citizens United and now McCutcheon United and have been saying that we need to have um, a, an amendment in place that limits contributions. This is Citizens United here. I've been talking about it and restrictions on organizational contributions. Now we have McCutcheon at all, and the decision there gave billionaires the same kind of freedom that Citizens United gave corporations. So we've covered politics. Now we'll move on to the economy and work. What will we be looking at in this one? Economic systems. Take a look at capitalism in China. Work and alienation. The changing economy. Some of the questions we'll be asking. What makes work satisfying? 
How have the trends towards deindustrialization changed the work people do? What will the workforce of the 20th century look like? First of all, let's define what the economy is. The economy is a social institution responsible for the production, distribution, and consumption of goods and services. Everybody participates in the economy. You work to earn money in the economy. Anytime you go shopping, you're interacting within the economy. A lot of our food is very, very, very inexpensive. But some of this happens because, with regards to certain foods, some of this happens because farmers are getting exploited by, um, they're not making as much money because of the tariffs being charged and things like that. What are called fair trade foods, and coffee is one specific example I can think of. I believe there's a fair trade tea as well. Um, so when consumers voluntarily pay above market prices so that the money going to the workers is increased as well. When we think about working in another economy, in a foreign economy, we think about working conditions and stuff like that, um, we have to be careful not to judge according to our own cultural standards. Um, we need to practice cultural relativism, viewing foreign workers and factory owners from the perspective of their own cultures. As I said, economic system is a social institution through which goods and services are produced, distributed, and consumed. Industrial society, society that has progressed beyond the use of animal power for production, depends on industrial forms of power. Now, capitalism and socialism are two of the industrial societies. Capitalism, of course, is where um, the means of production are held largely in private hands. There are a few things like utilities that are nominally subject to government regulation, but for the most part, car factories, food, things like that are all produced where the factories are owned privately and are operated for profit. Profit itself is the main incentive for economic activity. Individuals able to make more money. Adam Smith was a theorist in the Welsh, who wrote about capitalism in the Wealth of Nations and wrote about how um, the division of labor in factory line production would actually increase the overall productivity of the human species and allow for um, the creation and accumulation of wealth. In order for this to work, though, um, you have to have a laissez-faire market. Laissez-faire comes from two French verbs, to let or allow and to make or to do. So laissez-faire essentially seem, means allow it to make itself. So the way that Adam Smith phrased it is the market will be self-regulating as if there is an invisible hand controlling supply and demand. One of the problems, though, that you can encounter in a free market economy is what's called a monopoly, and it's when one company or one person, single firm, controls a particular product in the economy. Something like um, computers or the software on which computers operate. Um, if you control more than three quarters of that particular market, the production in that market, it means you can charge whatever you want and government will usually step in and, you know, 
claim an antitrust violation um, because you're not really allowing the market to regulate the price. Um, similar to a monopoly is an um, oligopoly, which would be when a few key businesses control a particular market and they get together and engage in what's called price fixing, where they decide what they're going to charge collectively. Um, and it has the same effect as monopoly. It's when products are not responding to the laws of supply and demand. So moving beyond capitalism, we have socialism. Uh, this is where the means of production are either state-owned or state-controlled. Um, but they're collectively owned rather than privately owned. The, dis the distinction between socialism and communism is that in socialism, um, everybody shares in the profits because everybody together owns the means of production. But there can still be differing shares in the um, in the products. In communism, everybody shares equally, and no distinctions are made on ability to produce. So what it's saying is is that doctors get paid the same as ditch diggers, and lawyers get paid the same as laborers. And the idea behind that is that every occupation uh, becomes equally necessary in a society um, if you have some occupations that aren't filled, that will mean more work for people in other occupations. Like if we look at dish diggers and doctors, well, arguably doctors provide a good service, but the fact that ditch diggers dig the ditches to put the sewers in means that doctors' workload is reduced because we live in a more sanitary society where people aren't getting sick from wading around in human filth. So that's the big distinction between socialism and communism, is that in communism, um, you have the same collectivity of ownership, but in communism, you also have the mantra of, and the way that Marx originally wrote it was, from each according to his ability to each according to his need. Now, the informal co uh, economy, um, of which what you would call the black market is a part, um, transfer of money, goods, or services not reported to the government. And everybody's participated in the informal economy at times. If you've ever gone to a garage sale, um, or if you had a garage sale, do they tell you how much you paid in taxes for the purchase of whatever you might have bought there? Or if you had a lawn mowing business, or a snow shoveling, or... Um, Babysitting, if you did any of that kind of work as a teenager, did you always pay taxes on everything? If not, it's part of the informal economy. In the U.S., it amounts to about 8% of the economic activity. Um, in developing nations, it will represent a much higher percentage. Uh, but the informal economy also includes, as I said, the black market, which are sort of uh, criminal activities that, uh, our economic production models as well. Six years from now, China is predicted to become the world's largest economy, exceeding the United States of America in terms of how much it produces economically. The Chinese have become a lot more interested in um, acquiring latest consumer goods, the reason for this is the burgeoning middle class that's in, growing in China right now as China undergoes industrialization. Um, a lot of the factory jobs are among the best jobs in the Chinese economy and are enabling people to um, purchase goods. Additionally, China is becoming more and more college educated as well. Um, with the burgeoning middle class right now, driven by those two things, more professionals in their economy and uh, manufacturing. Initially, the CCP, or the China, Chinese Communist Party, was very enthusiastic about allowing capitalism to operate. Unfortunately, it reduced their control. 
Um, as I understand it, capitalism is allowed to operate in China in three or four areas. Hong Kong, of course, but also I believe Shanghai, Beijing, um, and I don't know if there's another city or not. Initially, following the Chinese Revolution, everything was operated for the common good. Um, there was nothing done for profit. In the 1960s, China's economy was dominated by state-controlled enterprises. Government eased restrictions on private enterprise, allowing some private enterprises, I believe among the first were some of the restaurants like McDonald's and others, um, but eased restrictions on private enterprise. And by the mid-1990s, party officials began giving businesses um, licenses to operate certain businesses uh, to private entrepreneurs. This brought about inequality amongst Chinese workers, the growing free market economy. The Chinese bourgeoisie, as Marx would call them, or the capitalists, have to compete with multinational corporations where prior to the really opening up, um, they were more like the favored amongst the, the local businesses. So you can see multinational corporations operate on a global scale. GM has factories around the world. 2006, GM in China was more profitable than GM in the U.S. As a society undergoes industrialization as a process, it creates a lot of what's called structural social mobility. Mobility that is there because of an increase in opportunities. So the loosening of the Chinese Communist Party's central control um, led to a rise in structural mobility, job mobility, um, and then even increased prosperity for family-owned businesses. As happens in most societies, urban salaries tend to move up at a more rapid pace than rural salaries, and you tend to see more uh, safety regulations in place in urban areas than you do in rural areas. Doesn't take long for rural people to begin to figure out that they can come and work as laborers in cities. And so many middle-aged urban workers were losing their jobs to rural migrants seeking higher wages in urban areas. The majority of China's population still lives a traditional agricultural lifestyle, a subsistence-based existence. There's been a great deal of social mobility for a limited number of individuals, um, but there are some serious social problems right now um, in China. One issue is with the for-profit colleges um, because they're not providing good education for the students, and the students aren't able to find a job, but they're settled with a lot of debt. When we move ahead and look at factory line production, both Marx and Weber had ideas on alienation. Durkheim argued that a division of labor in society creates a different type of solidarity. And individuals, 
because they're bound tightly to society if society relaxes workers can experience what he called anomie if social regulations relax and society becomes more tolerant and more specialized as people take on different jobs um, people can experience anomie which is a loss of direction a loss of connectivity what Marx called meant by a meaningful relationship with work Marx believed that people express themselves express their lives in a creative fashion through the work that they did however if the type of work they were doing was what Marx referred to as meaningless work which is his characterization for factory work where a worker does the same repetitive motion time and time again and the same oversimplified task there's no sense of that worker in the product essentially think about it this way does it matter who's making french fries when you go to mcdonald's or don't those french fries come out the same way every time there's no sense of the worker in the object being produced and so for marx alienation is the estrangement that results as workers have lost expressive work, meaningful work, in favor of repetitive, meaningless factory work. It's a four-stage process. Marx essentially said that workers become alienated from the product that they're working on, from the process of work itself, from themselves as creatively expressive beings, and from all their fellow workers because you had a, an entire factory full of people who had gone, undergone alienation so workers need greater control over the workplace and the products of their labor the factory line doesn't slow down because a worker's not feeling particularly good the factory line comes at a set pace and a worker has to perform to that set pace in order to keep their job so what we're looking at here is workers actually becoming subservient to the product being produced. Burnout refers to the stress um, kind of uh, resulting from working too hard, becoming burned out at doing something. And by the 1980s, this was what was happening. Weber also had ideas about alienation as a process, but he said it comes from within the wor within work. It comes from the impersonality of the bureaucratic structure that exists within all industrialized organizations. So. How do workers not experience alienation? Well, if you have a larger degree of responsibility for the overall product, higher wages, shorter work week, positive relationship with coworkers, then you have pretty high worker satisfaction. George Ritzer was a sociologist who wrote a book called The McDonaldization of Society, um, in which he looked at how the kind of organizational form pioneered by McDonald's um, in the 30s in the production of food has come to dominate more and more organizations. The, not necessarily the exact way that it's laid out in McDonald's, but the thinking that goes into the type of production that McDonald's does. How can we streamline and simplify this to create a greater amount of speed and serving a higher number of customers? Richard said people working in those conditions in McDonaldized organizations 
have little job satisfaction regardless of what they may report. One of the things that's changing about our workforce right now is the increasing prevalence of telecommunication or teleworking, telecommuting to work. Increasingly, it's becoming possible for people to work from their home. In fact, there are Ivy Tech professors who teach classes living in states other than Indiana, living quite far. We have, let's see, one I know of, I believe, in Louisiana, one in Texas, one in Arizona, um, who teach some online classes. I could easily do these lectures from my house as well. In fact, today I am. So the workforce environment is changing, but also the workforce itself is changing. Women continue to enter the workforce, and minorities continue to gain greater access to jobs in the workforce. Um, our workforce is going to be a different makeup, decreasingly white male and increasingly women and racial and ethnic minorities. 52% of the new workers from 1988 to 2018 are expected to be women. This can actually be a beneficial thing given that people have positive outcomes at work because in an environment where people are exposed to people from different backgrounds, racial, ethnic, gender lines, as far as backgrounds go, and they work together on a project, when they have a positive outcome, it actually increases tolerance. So a more diverse workforce means that we will be seeing an increasingly tolerant workforce. Deindustrialization is what the United States society is undergoing right now. We're outsourcing manufacturing jobs. It's a systematic, widespread withdrawal of investment in basic aspects of productivity. Corporate restructuring, we've seen some of that. Downsizing, um, that's been happening with the increasing prevalence of uh, robotics in whatever manufacturing is left in the U.S. Um, and getting rid of a lot of manufacturing out of the U.S., but it comes with cost. People have lost their jobs and have been forced to accept lower paying jobs. Um, right now, we're in a crisis with regards to uh, people's job security, people's pay, the benefits they get at work. Um, a lot of the people working in the service sector, which is roughly a third of our economy, are working low paying jobs that don't really even pay a living wage. Offshoring or outsourcing, as I mentioned, it's transferring types of work to foreign contractors. Um, it improves the efficiency of business operations, continuing a stream of goods to a capitalist economy, to the market. Um, so functionally, offshoring actually does have benefits for a society in that it continues the stream of goods into a U.S. economy, but um, it also increases economic independence, interdependence in the production of goods and services. From a conflict perspective, this is just another way in which the workers get exploited. There's been a lot of work outsourced or offshored began when U.S. companies transferred manufacturing to foreign factories. It's not just the manufacturing jobs themselves. It's a jobs across the wide range of occupational fields. 
microfinancing is something that has become increasingly popular instead of large business loans small business loans essentially loans of three to five thousand dollars to help people get ahead maybe pay for tuition to college something like that you know community college but the idea behind the original microfinancing is so people could start small home businesses and they can work their way out of poverty it was kind of pioneered in the Indian subcontinent and it has proven to work because Roughly 98% of the loans, or over 90% of the loans, I don't know exactly what I, I'd heard as high as 98% of the loans actually get paid back because the people are very successful in their small business ventures. So 91 million people in 100 different countries in 2011, or the estimate um, from 2011. Of course, there are criticisms. Some lenders are taking advantage of the poor. Randall Collins is a sociologist who works in both functionalism and interactionists. Um, but he says, when we look at applying sociology here, poor people can ex significantly improve their circumstances through mutual support. Feminists look at it as beneficial because not just here in the United States, but um, on a global scale, like even in Mexico, um, women are increasingly the recipients of these micro loans. Functionalist perspective, you're putting larger firms out of work and they don't have the production so there's not the demand for formal employment opportunities how can sociologists participate in the real world by making policy suggestions here's a couple ideas for policy suggestions okay that concludes our lecture for today.